I'd like to welcome everyone to the June 2023 edition of NDSU Extension Agribusiness's Agricultural Market Situation Outlook Webinar Series. Uh, same same format as as has been for a few years now. Uh, we'll have a series of presentations uh, followed by Q and A. Uh, we ask that you use the Q and A tool to ask questions or the chat if you'd prefer. Uh, with that, I'll turn it right over to Brian Parman. All right, I'm gonna share my screen. All righty. Uh, so today's uh, I got two topics essentially. I'm gonna cover one kind of briefly, and then. The other one, I guess, kind of briefly as well, but uh, just two that I want to go through. I want to talk about interest rates in the Fed real quick, who uh, are, have met this week, and then some of the highlights from the farm business management records data uh, that we put together uh, recently. All right, so starting with the Fed, um, first of all, the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, put these charts out every month, um, and this these charts are referenced the previous month, so this is for May, but it comes out in June um, so that we can see what the um, price changes are. And this this uh, May report showed that inflation, uh, overall inflation was down from 4.9 to 4%, uh, with food prices up 6.7%. And uh, the biggest driver of overall inflation dropping from 4.9 to 4% was this 11.5 or 11.7% uh, drop in energy costs. But the Fed tends to focus on this core inflation number, which is 5.3%. And that was uh, a month ago was 5.6. And now it's 5.3. And the reason they do that is because of the volatility of uh, food prices and, and energy prices, how those can move. And the, the, uh, the core inflation tends to, in some opinions, reflect better how prices are, are moving. That isn't to say that energy and food costs do not matter. It's just that when they're gauging inflation, they like to focus on the core inflation number because the belief being that it's less volatile, it's a better reflection on our prices actually increasing or in deflationary cases decreasing uh, and not just uh, some swings in food and energy prices, which do do that. But that's, that was the report that came, and it was, uh, again, uh, inflation being at 4% is the lowest it's been in well over a year, year and a half for, for uh, annualized, and then core inflation at 5.3. The other information that came out is unemployment uh, still remains well below 4%, uh, is, is around 3.7. Um, the target's kind of been 45 and, and it's stayed low, and I put this chart up here just to show that basically unemployment, despite the Fed's rate hikes, uh, you look here at January of 2022, uh, they were began hike, hiking rates uh, last year in the spring and really has not had much of an impact on the unemployment rate, or at least as, as this one's tracked at all. The big spike in the middle was the uh, pandemic shutdowns. And you look at unemployment, it's essentially held steady at where it was prior to the pandemic actually occurring. I bring this up because this is a, a major metric that the Federal Reserve uses in determining, uh, is the economy slowing down? Are the rate hikes working along with the actual inflation number is what's going on with un unemployment. Here's the rate hikes uh, that, have, that began happening back in March of 2022. A uh, quarter of a, a percent, you know, half, three quarters, three quarters, all the way up at the top is the most recent meeting. And you can see it pretty much every meeting there were there were rate hikes until uh, June um, 14th. Uh, this this most recent meeting, uh, they decided to hold steady. So no rate increase at this uh, most recent meeting that came out. But the Fed, these are the biggest thing with this one is, is looking at the Fed's comments. OK, so they did not increase rates this time. And the uh, Fed's comments, and I kind of paraphrase some of this, sees progress on inflation, but not fast enough. Their words. Core inflation remains stubbornly high. Another another comment there. And then this was uh, a direct quote, basically, from from Jerome Powell, is that the labor market is surprisingly resilient or surprisingly strong. OK, and I, I put that in bold letters and underlined it because that is, again, a metric that they use and rely on, along with the inflation numbers uh, that come out every single month as to what they're going to do with interest rates. They project core inflation to be three to three and a half percent by the end of uh, the year and a strong possibility. Uh, this was mentioned what they said for two more rate hikes this year, given what the data says right now. 
And so the projections by uh, uh, Fed, Fed board members is for, you know, like I said, I, I, uh, uh, I didn't finish it out. My, my apologies for about a 5.6% uh, federal funds rate by the end of the year. And that would, that would require a, at least a couple of quarter, uh, maybe a, a half and a quarter point increase in the federal funds rate. And I just put this chart on here to show that the median where they were the, uh, because they vote on this, uh, about 5.6% by the end of the year, which again, we're at five and a quarter. So you would need at least a couple of quarter point rate hikes to get to that. And so that's kind of what came out of it, that they're holding, holding, uh, steady right now to wait and see what the the data shows for June and what they've done already, how that's kind of percolating through the economy, but more than just a real possibility that they're going to be a couple more rate hikes coming in, in the future uh, as they see that core inflation number uh, sticking there. All right. So real quick on the farm business management record highlights, 2012, uh, I, I, I put $2,012 in here for 2022. So I uh, adjusted for inflation with this chart. And the reason I did that was so that we could compare and show that net farm income in 2022 was the highest ever. 2020, 2012 was the previous record. You'd have to go back to the early 80s, like 1980, to see a number that high. And 2022 uh, beat even that. It, it beat uh, 2021 uh, as well last year, which was a strong year. Despite coming in with those uh, high costs to the year, uh, net farm income last year was the highest on record. And so one of the things we do is uh, we use the farm financial scorecard as a benchmark for the financial ratios to see uh, how uh, farms uh, are performing in all these different uh, areas, liquidity, solvency, profitability, um, as well as these others, uh, repayment capacity and financial efficiency. And this is the first time I've ever put this together. Uh, where I had this many um, categories in the green. So this is for the non Red River Valley and green is good. Yellow is depending on how close to green or red you are, could be okay or, or looking weak. And then of course, red is vulnerable. And you look through this and you can just see that basically across the board, we've got strong uh, ratios for everything in liquidity, everything pretty much in solvency, uh, profitability. Uh, I mean, this is almost 4.4, almost 45%, or that would have been green too for the non-Valley. Uh, repayment capacity numbers. I know total debt uh, and term debt coverage ratios are something that like lenders look at pretty strongly. And this is more than 100% higher than even the benchmark. Uh, one and a half is considered a, a strong total debt coverage ratio. And this is four for the non-value. Term debt's 1.75. And again, this is over four. Uh, financial efficiency, uh, operating expense ratio, uh, just barely in the yellow, but, but pretty close. You want it to be below 60%. It pretty much is at 60%. Depreciation, not bad. Interest expense, that hasn't been a factor for years, but I think that's going to change here in the uh, next year or so. And then net farm income ratio again, strong. And that's for the non-Valley. You look at the Red River Valley and they strong as well. Uh, pretty much across the board, good numbers uh, for all of these categories, liquidity, liquidity solvency, uh, profitability, repayment capacity, and financial efficiency. And so I made this little table here uh, for these ratios. And there used to be 21 of these FFSC ratios. Then they, they shrunk it down to 17 now. That, that are used instead of the 21. And what they got rid of was a lot of the uh, nominal categories where you would just say working capital or, or those kind of numbers, what the net farm income actually is, because it's you can't compare farm to farm with those numbers. A big farm is going to have a lot of working capital. A small farm would obviously need less. And depending on what kind of industry you're in, uh, Livestock feeding obviously needs a lot more working capital than, than perhaps a crop operation does. But you can see the Red River, actually the non-Valley performed a very similar, if not slightly better, a bit better than the, than the Red River Valley did. But still, uh, we're kind of splitting hairs there, uh, both uh, off the Valley and in the Red River Valley of a very strong year uh, in 2022. And I put this in to show that... Uh, while some of it did come from government payments and crop insurance uh, in 2022, not nearly as much as in 2021, especially on the insurance side. 
and not not as much on government payments as well, especially compared to like 2020, which was high, uh, a lot a lot of it coming from like uh, CFAP, but still significantly higher than the previous year uh, that we had essentially net farm incomes coming in close to that, which was 2012. And you see there, it actually had uh, very little coming in the way of crop insurance and government payments. Almost all of it was from production and, and strong prices. So still some coming in 2022, but such a, such a strong year that, uh, that, that government payments and crop insurance, while, while a factor, definitely a factor, not the, not the ma major cause of the, the high, high incomes. And I think that this is interesting to look at uh, is the rate of return on assets and equity per farm. So you look at 2012, which would be the previous year or period where we, where we were having strong net farm incomes in North Dakota. And these rates of return on assets and equity, are, especially on uh, uh, equity, was significantly higher in 2012 compared to 2022, even though the net farm income was higher in, in 2022. The reason why? Asset costs, uh, the value of equity has just gone up so much in the last couple of years, especially uh, we've got land prices that have gone up double digits a couple of years in a row. We've got uh, equipment costs that have gone up dramatically, you know, well into the double digits uh, and, and expected to continue to increase, at least in the near term, uh, causing this rate of return on equity and assets to, to decline, even though we've had strong net farm incomes. Um, you, you increase the value of those units, you have to make a lot more money of them off of them to get this, to get these rates of returns higher. And it's, it's, we have made a lot more, uh, there's been a lot of income generated in farming, but the costs of these uh, assets, the major, the major assets in production have just gone up so much that these rates of returns on equity and assets have, uh, have declined. And I just show this to show purchases of machinery and equipment and buildings uh, based on this data. I mean, it's obviously a, a massive record. And I do think some of it is the purchase of, uh, obviously the purchase of new equipment because we've had additional income. But I think a lot of it is just because equipment costs have gone up. This is in dollars, not in number of uh, uh, new pieces of equipment bought. And since it's in dollars, this big increase here, could uh, a lot of it I think is explained in just the, the high cost of uh, uh, farm equipment and, and overall equipment prices. So by and large, uh, a great year in 2022. Um, one of the best ever, uh, even though the rates of returns are a little less than we'd like to see. And so now we're looking toward next year and trying to decide, okay, uh, you know, Frayne's going to come on soon and talk about uh, crop prices. But uh, at the end of the day, you know, the, the, our production costs from last year versus this year uh, were projected to be about the same, very similar with an increase in interest rates, obviously. Uh, a decrease in fertilizer to an extent, but an increase in equipment costs. So we're kind of balancing out those increases and decreases. And overall, the projection on production costs was about to be the same last year versus this year. So then the big question will be what happens with our crop uh, yields, um, what prices are able to be secured to evaluate. And we'll take a look at it and see where we where we wind up uh, overall, given, given those factors. And then my last comment on the Fed thing. Again, take away saying that there's probably going to be a couple more rate hikes in the future. It's going to depend on uh, the data coming in. But right now, it looks like that core inflation number is remaining pretty sticky and the labor market remains pretty tight. And as long as that continues to be the case, uh, they're, they're saying that there's probably going to be a couple more rate hikes, maybe finishing out the year around 5.6% on the federal funds rate, which would probably roughly translate to 7, 7.5% um, interest rates a little higher than they are now. So with that, I will go ahead and stop my screen sharing. And I believe Frayne Olson, Dr. Olson, will be uh, your next speaker. All right. Thank you, Brian. Uh, let me share my screen now and we'll get rolling. So I'm going to provide, uh, so my name, again, my name again, Frayne Olson. I'm the crop economist and marketing specialist with NDSU Extension. Um, here's my contact information. So if you do think of something Later on that you want to visit about, I'd be happy to do that. Um, we will have uh, some time at the end of this session for some Q&A, and, and hopefully I'll, I'll make some statements to try and stimulate some discussion as well. So I'm going to take a, a real quick review of the most recent information we got out of the USDA, um, as well as an update on you know some of the things that are market forces now that are creating quite a rally today, and I'll talk about that in a bit more detail. 
Uh, so first, uh, what are the current key issues? And right now, the Eastern Corp Melt in particular is becoming dry. Uh, one of the main reasons we saw uh, this pop in the market today um, is that the U.S. drought monitor maps got updated uh, and came out that there was uh, an increase in the area, primarily for corn and soybean uh, country, that is now de uh, in some level of drought. It, even though it's a pretty minimal level, it's still showing up as drier conditions. And I'll talk more about that in just a moment. The other thing is we our export sales uh, in particular for wheat and corn, even though seasonally we don't have really great export sales at this time of year, um, when we look at what's happening in the global markets right now, both U.S. wheat and U.S. corn is, is relatively high compared to other exporting countries. And so uh, we are having some export sales, but they have really, really slowed down given the relative value of U.S. products in the global market versus, the United, versus other countries. And so uh, there's some... some counterfactual things going on here that are also, uh, I, I guess, causing some concerns, at least from my perspective, longer term. But right now, the weather is really kind of trumping everything that's out there right now. Uh, the other thing, as a reminder, on June 30, USDA will release their acreage report, which is an update to the uh, prospective plantings re report that we got in March. Again, this is a farmer-based survey of the acreage that actually did get planted. Um, so we'll be able to cross-check what, what what the planting intentions were versus what actually got seeded. Uh, right now, my expectation is we're not going to have any major or substantial shifts or adjustments. Uh, but a, of course, until we get the numbers, we don't know. So with that, I'm going to pretend to be uh, my do my best uh, imitation of of a crop economist here. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what came out in the reports. Um, this is for old crop. Um, these are ending stocks numbers for old crop. We've got all wheat, corn, and soybeans. Uh, just as a refresher course on, on the very top row and highlighted in blue is the average trade estimate. This is what the, the private analysts and traders were expecting to see. Um, towards the bottom, the highlighted in black was the numbers we got last month. And of course, on the very bottom highlighted in red are the numbers that we got in the June report. So when we compare, there's there's two different ways of comparing this. One, what happened this time relative to the last month. And, and in my case, probably the more important is what happened this month relative to what the trade was expecting to see. So I'm really going to compare the, the blue row and the red row. Um, not any major for old crop. There wasn't really any major adjustments. There wasn't any big surprises. Um, really for the only adjustments that USDA made, the all wheat numbers were identical for both production and consumption. Again, this is old crop. We're getting very close to the end of the marketing year now. So those numbers should be, become final soon. Uh, for corn and soybeans, the two things that were adjusted downward was both corn export sales, uh, total forecast for the year, as well as soybeans, the exact same thing. So when we look at the blue row versus the red row, those adjustments that were made was all because of reductions or slippage in the, the usage, the amount of, of total exports that we expect to see out of the United States. But again, the trade was expecting a lot of that. So if you compare the red to the blue, the trade was expecting to see some lower numbers. We got those lower numbers. Actually, they were a little bit more, uh, more of a reduction than the trade was expecting. Now, again, not bigger earth shattering changes, but tweaks and adjustments along the way, basically confirming that uh, the, the USDA forecasts are confirming what we have seen happening in the marketplace. So moving into new crop. Now, this is, if you notice before it was old crop, this would be the new crop ending stock. So this is the crop that's currently growing. Again, we want to compare the green line, the very top row with the bottom line, which is red. Um, very similar numbers. So the USDA's uh, numbers that were actually reported were very close to what the trader is expecting. Again, the reason that the ending stocks for, in particular, corn and soybeans went up is because the um, ending stocks from last year roll into this year's numbers. So for the corn and soybean yield, as well as, as consumption numbers, they really didn't change from the previous month. For wheat, the only reason we got a slight increase in ending stocks for all wheat is because there were some small adjustments in the expectation for yields, for in particular yields in the uh, very southern winter wheat belt. 
Um, the other thing that we did get out of the report um, on last Friday was some updates on production forecast for the wheat complex, specifically the winter wheat complex. So again, I want to focus on the different classes. We've got hard red winter wheat in the middle. On the far right-hand side, we've got soft red winter wheat and then the white winter. So I really want to focus on those numbers specifically and, and talk a little bit about where did the where did where the changes occurring. So when we can when we compare what we saw during the May report versus the June report, there was a slight increase in total production, in particular for hard red winter wheat. The main reason was because there was a slight increase in the yield forecast coming out of Texas and Oklahoma. Um, so again, not major changes. If you notice the the blue row uh, on the very top versus the red row on the bottom. Uh, very similar to what, what the trade was expecting to see. So no big shock value, basically confirmation of what we were expecting to see from those reports. Now, again, at the end of the month, we're going to have an update on planted acreage, and we will like we will see those planted acreage numbers adjusted then in the July report. One more comment before I move on. Um, just for everybody's, as a reminder for everyone, USDA will not adjust the yield numbers, their yield forecasts for corn and soybeans until the August report. So even though we're starting to see some drier conditions in the winter wheat, uh, excuse me, in the, in the corn belt show up, which I'll show you in just a moment, USDA is not going to adjust their yield forecast for, for, um, for uh, corn and for soybeans until the August report when they do a farmer-based survey. They take a combination of farmer-based sur survey plus satellite imagery, and they try and do their updates to their forecasting models. So you're probably going to hear some private analysts really bash USDA during the July report that they haven't adjusted their yield forecasts. The point is they don't adjust their yield forecasts in July. That's not part of their process. That's not the methodology they use. So there's going to be a lot of debate and discussion about what, again, like every year, what kind of what yields are we going to be getting into? So I, I was going to say this before, but I'm going to do my best imitation of a weather forecaster here and talk a little bit about not only soil moisture conditions, but more importantly, what is the weather going to look like as we move forward? Because it, right now, this is the topic. This is the story that everybody is, is, is focusing on. So the drought monitor map got updated this morning. This is the updated map. Um, notice that as you get into the core uh, eastern Corn Belt in particular, notice there's that huge dry red spot in eastern Nebraska. Uh, moving into Iowa and even into Missouri, those, some of those dry conditions we had seen before, but they have now extended into the northern half of Illinois. So we get into the Illinois area, we get into southern uh, Wisconsin, Indiana, Ohio. This region in this central corn belt, central and eastern corn belt, is really where a lot of the concern and issues are starting to show. Now, I'm going to show you a, kind of a sequence of other maps that will basically tell you the same story, but in a little bit different way. Now, the drought monitor map is trying to measure or get an estimate of how deep within the soil profile is this dry layer starting to move? So the yellow areas typically represents that the crop is showing some stress. It's abnormally dry. That's the yellow. The crop might be showing some stress, but it's not that the, that soil moisture or the lack of soil moisture has gone really deep into the soil profile. By the time you get into these really dark reds and maroons like you see in, in Kansas or even in eastern Nebraska, the the dry layers move so deep in the soil that your soil profile that now you're starting to get wells that are going dry, uh, stock ponds are drying up. You have much deeper or more dramatic, uh, not only agricultural but just other consequences for the dry weather. So please think about this as as how how deep into the soil profile is that dry layer moving. Now the next map I'm going to show you. This is from if you notice the dates. This is from. June 12th. Uh, this is uh, information that's put together by a joint venture between NASA as well as USDA. And then what they're trying to do is measure in this map, if you notice on the right hand side, this is soil moisture. So we're looking at volumetric soil moisture. So we're taking the ratio of water volume in the soil relative to the soil volume. 
So if you look at the scaling on the right-hand side, think of those as percentages. So in the green area, we're looking at about 35% of that soil profile is water. Now this is for the top six inches. So we're, we're really trying to look at that very top kind of top soil layer. All right, now notice if we get into these areas in central Nebraska, you get into areas, for example, in parts of Iowa and Northern Illinois, you get into Wisconsin, even up here in North Dakota, in particular, you get into Western North Dakota, Northeastern Montana. Um, this soil layer, this top of six inches of soil is very dry. I want to caution everybody, one really good rain shower, if we have an inch or inch and a half rain shower that comes through, that first six inches are going to be replenished. You know, obviously plants will, will have a reprieve from some of the some of the drier conditions. Another way of measuring this, and this is also at the six inch depth. Again, these are all computer generated models. They're using, uh, this is using information over many, many years. So here, what we're looking at is the deviation from average. So when we look at typical soil moisture versus what we're seeing right now, what does that look like? So there are areas obviously within the Corn Belt that get a lot more moisture than we do up here in the Northern Plains. And so they typically have a lot more soil moisture available. So let's not only look at what the absolute levels are, but more importantly, how does this current soil moisture compare to a longer term average? Now, again, NASA and, and USDA have been doing this for quite a few years. They're going back to 2015 as the baseline. So we're going 2015 through 2022 as that reference point for average or historical. And they're comparing today's numbers with what you would normally see at this time of year. Once again, when you start looking at what's going on, in particular, and Brian was just talking about this earlier before we came on, you get into western Nebraska, southwest Nebraska, where he's from, you know, over the last several weeks, they've had a lot of rainfall. And, and has really, at least on the surface moisture, replenished a lot of the surface moisture area. The really deep subsoil layers have not been replenished yet, but at least on the surface, they have been. Now let's shift over into, well, let's look at North Dakota, in particular, Northwest North Dakota and Northeast North Dakota. There are areas up here relative to normal, we're well behind our normal pace or our normal rainfall and soil moisture conditions. We look at, again, this, this starting with about the eastern half of Iowa going particularly into the northern half of Illinois um, and, and a little bit into, into Michigan and um, Indiana. This area right here is the area that uh, the pocket that everybody's really starting to worry about. The reason I'm bringing this up again is I have a real big problem with people using social media photos to demonstrate how bad things are. The last time I checked, I have I have yet to see a, a Facebook post or a, a Twitter post of a photo of a field that is absolutely picture perfect. Every time you see a picture, it's going to be the picture of the worst field in the worst corner you're going to see. So I will tell you right now, you're going to hear stories and see photos that are showing up. I've already seen a couple show up in the last couple of days. And there's, the photos are coming from this pocket up here in Northern Illinois. And yes, we have a problem there. There's going to be some issues, but this is not representative of the entire Eastern Corn Belt. So we have to be very careful about thinking about this logically and not getting too caught up in the emotional issues. So again, this is at the six inch depth. So one or two really good rain showers coming through, all of this is gonna clear up and we're gonna get back to more of an average map setting. When we get into the deeper soil levels, and I do want to bring this up, now we're back to this volumetric measure. So what percentage of the, the total soil profile is made up of water versus actual soil? Uh, again, notice that the deeper greens are starting to show up again. So now we're trying to measure the amount of, of water in the top three feet. Okay, so now you get a little bit different picture about what's going on. And this is where this map is going to differ a bit from what you see within the, the um, drought monitor map. So again, we got to be careful about how deep within the soil profile are we going. So if we think about this top three feet as kind of the, the maximum depth for the root zone, we do have some moisture later on or, or within that uh, deeper soil layer that the crop can tap into. Now, again, that the crop has to develop enough, has to get enough growing degree days, enough heat units, 
enough daylight hours to be able to tap into that. But there is soil, some soil moisture underneath this to be able to, to sustain the crop, even though it looks like we're going into a drier period. Um, one more way of representing this, and I do want to point out the date. This was taken on June 11th. This actually comes out of the same um, offices that put together the drought monitor maps. So what they're trying to do here is their vegetative drought response index. So basically, they're using, again, satellite imagery and NDVI, the, the vegetative health, uh, to be able to look at how green is the crop today relative to what we would normally see at this time of year. Okay, so this includes what, what they call complete. So there's a way you can filter out for just cropland acres or just pasture land acres or the complete picture. And so I chose the complete picture to try and give you a better idea kind of geographically of where we're looking at, at this. And there are areas and pockets, for example, parts of the Golden Triangle up here in, in Montana that are actually in very, very good shape, if not even a little wet. But then we get into this pocket in... In Nebraska, we get some of these drier conditions going on in Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio. Again, this is vegetative health. So we're comparing, um, it's the relative health. So we're comparing the, the greenness of the crop today versus what we would normally see. So we're looking at that and saying, you know what, there is some drought conditions starting to show up. There's some drought stress starting to show up in the area. So looking forward, this is from National Weather Service. I pulled this this morning. Um, this is a forecast that they made as of yesterday. For the precipitation outlook, you know, it looks like we in our area may get some reprieve. We may have some rain showers coming through, uh, hopefully being able to recharge some of that initial topsoil moisture, give us some, some at least some, um, some time frame to be able to continue to get that crop developed. But when you look at this Northern Illinois, Eastern um, Iowa and into Indiana and Ohio, this pocket, and, and again, Southern uh, Wisconsin, which is also very heavy in the crops area, this pocket in here is kind of the bullseye to say, look, it looks, it doesn't look like that region, which is now suffering the most, is going to get much of a reprieve. They're not going to get those rain showers to come through and re recharge that, the soil moisture in that root zone. Now, the other thing that's going to happen, if again, if US, if the National Weather Service is correct, is we're also looking at average to slightly above average uh, precipit, um, excuse me, temperatures, i.e., hot and dry. Now, in our region, again, if we can get those rain showers, the higher temperatures, you know, for those later planted crops will be help us to be able to catch up a little bit on crop development. Uh, but again, we need the moisture to be able to have that growth spurt. But again, you go move into this. Southern uh, Minnesota, Iowa, Wisconsin, um, Illinois region, this pocket right here, over the next several weeks, you're going to be hearing a lot of discussions about what does the crop look like? What's the crop health? What does this mean for potential yields and yield forecasts coming out of the Eastern Corn Belt? So even though last year, the big, big issue was in the Western Corn Belt, Eastern Corn Belt had a fantastic year. It looks like some of that those weather patterns are shifting and it looks, it looks like this Eastern Corn Belt is gonna have some more problems. So the rally we have going on right now, um, we are now at market close. Uh, November soybeans were up 52 cents today. Uh, December uh, corn was up 25 cents today and September spring wheat was up also about 26 cents today. So. This weather forecast right now, we're getting this, this weather rally, you know, weather rallies tend to be very short-lived and, and with a lot of spikes. So if you do have some both old crop and or possibly some new crop, uh, I think we're getting to those ranges where you're going to be looking at some additional sales. So with that, I'll be quiet and I'll hand things over to um, Tim Petrie for his report on the livestock sector. Good afternoon, everybody. Tim Petrie, Extension Livestock Marketing Economist. Just to kind of talk about the cattle situation today. Uh, the big news last week, but I think it's getting uh, kind of uh, a repeat news, is that we set another all-time record high for fed cattle prices last week. Up there just over 182 on a live basis and just a hair under 300 on a dress basis and had cattle up to here in the Northern Plains up to 303. So all-time record high prices. And um, 
Again, maybe just a color code here because all the rest of my charts are the same way as the red line is always what they're doing now. And then if there's a futures market, the uh, red squares are this year's futures and the gold are next year's futures. So uh, uh, anyway, the cattle keep marching along. And uh, two things we always say as economists that affect prices are supply and demand. And so on the supply side, uh, again, we've re decreased the beef cow herd for four straight years. And so that's showing up in cattle on feed and cattle marketed and lower calf crops and so on. So that has been uh, really supporting uh, prices. And uh, so uh, uh, our previous record high was back in 2014 at just under 154. So you see we're well above that. And we'll set, not only are we setting weekly records, but we'll set a record for the year as well. And and then usually we do have some seasonal weakness into the midsummer. And there's, you see the June futures there and August futures down a little bit, but still well up in the mid uh, 60s there and back up to uh, almost 180 by the end of the year. So uh, things are, are still looking good there. And, and, you know, from a supply standpoint, I'll talk about beef production in a minute. But then the other thing that I want to talk about going to the bottom part of the chart is that demand for beef has held very strong, stronger than some people expected. And in a minute, we'll look at some the competing meats that aren't uh, uh, holding quite as strong. I just had a, a conference call on Tuesday with a couple of my counterparts around the, the U.S. and then with the USDA folks that helped put out the, the uh, WASD that Frame just got through talking about. And, you know, that's something everybody's uh, discussing now is why is beef holding so well uh, on the demand side and maybe some of the competing meats aren't. But, you know, when you look at the cutout value and that's just all the wholesale cuts added up, and I'll, we'll see a few wholesale cuts in a minute as well. Again, paralleling fed steer prices parallel the box beef cutout because the box beef cutout is, is uh, what the Packers can sell the wholesale meat for. And that is an indication of how meat is moving at the retail level. And as long as it's moving at the retail level uh, at, and, and, and really strong, prices are going up. So that's just exactly what's happening on the cutout. The cutout last week at uh, just at a right 325 there just under 325 was not a record high it's a, it's very much a historical high but back in 2020 remember back in COVID when all the packing plants shut down and everything and the shelves were bare we did uh, spike up for one week up there to 459 and then by two weeks later it was back down to 200 so we aren't at all-time record high but you could essentially say we're at historic highs outside of that COVID thing. And uh, this week, the, the, the uh, cutout keeps moving along. Uh, actually, this morning's cutout report showed 341.85 for this morning. So it looks like the cutout will be up again uh, this week. So just very, very strong beef demand and, uh, and, uh, and uh, continuing on. So, uh, <laughs> On the top left-hand side, then, is beef production. And yes, we know they see the red line there compared to the lighter blue line last year. And here on some of these charts, the uh, purple line is the 2017 to 21 average rather than on the livestock. I go back just on a yearly basis, four years. But you see, the our, our uh, beef production so far this year is running about 5% less than last year. And... Uh, closer to average and USDA actually is predicting 5% lower beef production this year. And then probably another five to 6% uh, reduction in beef production next year, which all would be supportive of prices. So that's part of the reason why we have the higher prices now is that we do have a uh, uh, lower production. But anyway, then uh, all Kind of interesting, all the different individual wholesale cuts that make up the cutout are all, it's just, we're not going to go through the numbers here in the interest of time, but let's just look at the red line compared to the blue line of last year. All cuts of beef are trading in some cases quite a bit higher than last year. Again, a strong 
indication of the robust demand that we have. On the upper right hand are the loins up, uh, you know, look at the blue line up significant, go to the, the bottom uh, left hand, the round prices again, significantly higher than last year. Usually they uh, peak out before now and it just uh, at historic highs. Uh, go to the bottom right hand is boneless beef that goes into hamburger. Hamburgers are selling very well as and, and again, significantly above last year. So, you know, that's that's all positive feeds back into fed cattle prices. And the two things that affect feeder cattle the most are fed cattle prices and corn prices that Frayne just got through talking about. And I will mention in a minute. So positive there. On the other hand, when we go to the competing meat, again, the same color here, you see the pork uh, cut out there on the top is quite a bit below what it was last year and below even the average. You go to the uh, uh, to the right-hand side there, the pork loin. Remember, beef loins that are quite a bit higher than last year, pork loins lower, and and uh, but then both the average and the and last year. Uh, down to the bottom left, broiler prices. Again, it, uh, that's chickens. Uh, they're down from where they were uh, last year. And look at chicken breasts are just not selling that well. And so, uh, again, beef is just moving very, very well. And that's funneling into fed cattle prices while the other, uh, <clears throat> some, uh, you know, indications are that the the economy, even though these are cheap, is, is affecting the volume there. So, Let's get into the individual uh, feeder cattle for uh, here. And so uh, here's our 550, 600 pound steers in North Dakota. And again, just have been, uh, you know, we've been inching up. The last cyclical price low was in 2020 and it was very much affected by COVID. And then we did inch them up in the purple line there, 2021. Last year, again, always the blue line. We saw improvement, but huge improvement this year. We're, uh, the last couple of weeks, we've been up there around 280 average. Some of them even bouncing uh, the high high selling ones up to even $300. So up at uh, at historic high levels are $80, 100 weight above last year. So significant improvement there. Again, usually, you know that we do see some weakness into the fall when the marketing season, that light blue arrow down at the bottom right hand of the chart, usually October 15th is the low there. So we are expecting some weakness in fall. And, and uh, you know, I mentioned corn prices in a minute. That's going to be the big thing to watch because we change corn 10 cents a bushel, change fall calf prices a buck in the opposite direction. So that's the big thing for us to watch for. Uh, you know, as, as the corn season progresses, as Frank said. But anyway, even with the seasonal decline and see what happens to corn, we're still expecting much better prices here this fall. Go to the heavier weight yearling prices, kind of the very same story here. We're trading about $80 more than we did last year. There's the futures. And, uh, you know, the futures were off. Uh, four dollars or so yesterday, and off another two dollars a day. Again, I'll kind of pick that up with my next slide that follows up on what what uh, Rain had to say. But anyway, the red futures there, the August, September, October, November futures, uh, showing us that you know that we're up there in you know two forty five, two forty to two hundred and fifty dollars, significantly higher than than last year. And and uh, so uh, again, we have to wait and see what corn is, but we're just uh, following fed cattle, again, two biggest things that affect feeder cattle prices are, are uh, corn and, and, and fed cattle. So we see these high prices, and I don't want people to get lured to sleep here and throw risk management out to the wind just because prices are high. And I at least expected to say, bet, stay better than they have been, although there's seasonal weakness in the fall. So, you know, uh, Cattle price, price risk management during the increasing phase of the cattle cycle is different than in the decreasing phase when prices are going down. It's good to get something locked in. So always when prices are high and at levels like they're now, there's always a lot of volatility in both the futures market and the cash market. The futures market, again, you know, the funds get in and they're just long and long and long and prices are going up. But then they start taking some profits and bail and 
<clears throat> so prices can be very volatile there. No, and there's always risk for lower uh, prices. Look at the competing meats, and we have the economy and so on. And and um, and uh, Brian mentioned some of those things, and we have uh, also the geopolitical things going on. And so, in the middle there, the best marketing strategy during the increasing phase of the price cycle is to lock in a floor price and then leave the top side open. And again, how much you lock in on the floor side really depends on your ability to take risk. New beginning farmers, uh, you know, probably need to get uh, pretty well priced up. But if, you know, you're a, a high equity producer, have everything paid for and so on, maybe not so much, but that's the best marketing strategy. The two ways to do that would be the, where you can do a floor price, but leave the top side open would be with uh, livestock risk protection insurance or futures market options. But just to go back to, you know, the volatility and want to follow up uh, I, with corn, you know, Brain did a good job of talking about corn and it's getting dry in the corn belt. 57% uh, of the corn belt is in some kind of drought. And so we just see what's happened here in the, the last week and a half, you know, uh, feeder cattle uh, are, are off there about uh, $10. And you, Frank talked about corn, so I don't want to be redundant of that, but we've seen the spike in corn prices here in the last week and a half or, or so up about 40 cents. And then today, just go back to that uh, change corn 10 cents, change feeder cattle a buck in the opposite direction, corn uh, up to over 20 cents today and feeder cattle were last I look about $2. So there is risk. And certainly, uh, I think looking at some kind of uh, floor price would be uh, recommended. When with that, then I think I'm finished, and we'll turn it over to Ron for some uh, talk about USDA. Uh, first of all, my name is Ron Haugen. You most of you probably have heard me before. I'm Extension Farm Management here at NDSU. <clears throat> I'm going to talk today about a couple of farm programs that I've mentioned before in our talks: the ER ERP program plus the, the, the PARP, P-A-R-P, a lot of, it, lot of acronyms. First of all, the ERP program, the phase two program that's, that was supposed to be done June 2nd has been extended. And I kind of thought this, th they would extend this because farmers were in the field and busy. And uh, so they extended it to July 14th. Now the phase two of the ERP, um, that's where you, where you, um, you uh, try to fill gaps of people that missed it out when you got the ES ERP phase one payment. And this is where you need to take gross, uh, gross revenue from your tax returns. Basically how that works, you pick your benchmark year and you pick your disaster years. Okay, and then if you are uh, a beginning farmer or a veteran, you get a little more payment. We still do not have any information on ERP two for livestock. We're still waiting on that. Just wanted to mention that. Now on the on the pandemic assistance revenue program, <clears throat> there again, it's been extended from June 2nd to July 14th. And this program is for uh, not just crop producers, but crop and livestock producers. Uh, the, the ERP was only for crops. So what that does, you compare your 18 or 19 calendar year to 2020, the, the COVID year, and it, you see if you have a drop in gross income. Now, there's been two, two webinars, at least, that FSA has done, one on a national level and one extension uh, tax uh, people uh, helped out. And they're very good webinars to watch if you're wondering how to, how to uh, apply for these two programs, if you haven't already. It uh, one program requires certain things off your tax return, and the other one re requires other things off your tax return, mainly just dealing with your gross farm income. And uh, so you got it's very specific on what you what you uh, numbers that you enter all needed to be uh, taken from your tax return, and you need to have your 1099s from FSA. Uh, certain uh, uh, government payments must be. Uh, taken out or added in, depending on the rules. Uh, and there's uh, very good fact sheets that show this on farmers.gov. Now, just recently, there was an announcement of the 2022 Emergency Relief Program. And now, we don't really know too much about that, but this is 
ERP 2022 phase one now. Okay, so we're assuming now that it's going to be similar to the ERP phase one, where you really didn't have to do anything. It just took a, a percentage of your crop of your crop insurance payment. Okay, and it's very streamlined. You basically just got your payment. For those that did not have crop insurance, then it was a little more uh, more of a procedure. You had to figure out your AGR, your allowable gross income. We don't know what years are going to be the reference years. Um, uh, will it be the higher of 18 or 19? Will it refer to 20 or 21 for the 22 ERP program? A lot of unknowns, but they did announce they, they were doing this program. Um, they all, all Also, the ERP for livestock, 2022. Two, phase one, that was a very simple process. All you needed to do was ha to uh, be in a county that had LFP and they paid you a part of the payment that you got. Now in 2022, I, I believe this is right, Tim, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I believe there's only five counties in 2022 that qualified for this. So, so the way I read this, probably most livestock producers wouldn't be eligible then. Um, but we'll wait and see on the details. They're coming. So as always, at the end, uh, we'll entertain questions. And uh, I was going to say, always contact your FSA office for any of these questions as well. The FSA, the North Dakota State FSA, are, is having training all week. But once they get done with that, I'm sure they'll know some more information. So I think I am the last speaker. So with that, we will entertain questions for myself or anybody else. Great. Thanks, Ron. Uh, and, and one of the unfortunate things, I guess, today with me not having a talk is that I have questions for people. Um, <laughs> unless people from the uh, audience would like to submit some either using the Q&A tool or the chat. Uh, my first one's for Frayne. I, got, I have two questions are kind of related. Um, updates related to the war in Ukraine. Uh, and then also a question about how does USDA WASD uh, consider that, think about those numbers as they as they put things together. Okay, so uh, update on the war and more specifically the grain corridor, um, the uh, Ukraine's ability to be able to move product through the Black Sea. Um, so Ukraine does have a couple choices in their in their shipping routes. The, the most efficient, the one that has the largest volumes is, is loading it on uh, by ocean vessel, loading it at typically right now at Odessa, because that's about the only port they have left open that actually can handle ocean going vessels or the larger capacity vessels. Um, the other two that they had have been bombed to a point where they're, they're not usable. Um, the grain corridor, which was really, a, it's an agreement between Russia, Ukraine, United Nations and Turkey to allow Ukrainian grain to be loaded in Odessa and then uh, traveling through the Black Sea unmolested because of the war efforts, uh, being inspected at, at in Istanbul before it leaves and, and enters the global markets. Now, as everybody remembers that that, that agreement was made, the original one was for, for six months, it was extended for six months, now it's been extended for two months. Right now, it's looking like that will not be extended again. The Russians are being very, very adamant about the fact that they gave some concessions or they were expecting some concessions uh, from the global community to be able to to be able to make their products move both agricultural products, both fertilizers as well as as grains, move more smoothly through the the global system. Um, in their view, that has not happened. Um, they, there's more and more statements now coming out that they are not going to renew that agreement when it comes up in, in about a month or so. And in fact, grain shipments out of Ukraine uh, through the port of Odessa have slowed significantly. It's not that they've gone to zero, but they've slowed significantly, kind of, I think, in, in anticipation of this. The problem that Ukraine has is they, they do have two other alternatives. They can try and rail it. Through uh um through through another port in um forget the name of the country but it's Constana is the name of the port but it's a very small port it doesn't have the loading capacity that you would have in Odessa the only other alternative is to try and rail it use the the rail system um 
moving through Ukraine. He hit the border of Poland and all of a sudden the track cha- track size changes. And so you literally have to offload the grain from a train in, in Ukraine, reload it onto a grain in Poland. Um, that grain has to be re-inspected and then it can travel into the Eastern, Eastern uh, European regions. So major, major heartburn for everybody. There are some countries, not necessarily the countries that we sell to out of the United States, but there are some countries uh, in particular in North Africa and the Middle East that are very dependent upon both Russian grain as well as Ukrainian grain as their primary source. Um, Now, even though we don't compete head to head with Russia and Ukraine into a lot of those markets, the fact that they're not able to ship or that the volumes are starting to drop have also lifted or supported global prices. So it is something that we need to watch. So it's kind of an indirect effect mm-hmm. for prices here in the U.S. Uh, but I, I do expect that as we move forward over the next month or so, we're going to hear more about it and likely will not get another extension, which means Ukraine now is going to have a much larger problem trying to get rid of, of actually their shipping volumes of corn have been larger than their ship vol- shipping volumes of wheat. Um, so it'll impact the corn market. It'll impact the wheat market globally. Um, to some degree, it'll impact uh, barley and, and some of the oil seeds, but those those exports so have, so far have been relatively small. How does USDA try and adjust for those? Uh, my smart smart aleck answer is uh, very carefully. Um, they <laughs> that that's always a very difficult thing. Um, they have been trying to adjust their forecasting models to compensate. For the extra costs and the and the the constrained shipping volumes coming out of the Black Sea regions, um, I you know I I think from what I can tell they have been reasonably close in their forecasts so far, uh, at least their annual forecasts. Uh, in fact, when I when I first saw them, I thought they were a bit um, aggressive. I thought they were they were being very optimistic at what Ukraine could actually ship, but as it turns out, they came up pretty close. So they are watching it closely. They are trying to model it. They're doing the best they can. Obviously, nobody knows exactly how this is going to work. But I have personally been surprised at how accurate their forecast have been to date. Thanks, Ryan. I have a question for Brian if, if he's hidden there in the darkness and come back online. Uh, just regarding interest rates, you know, actions by the Federal Reserve, you know, looking into what might happen, you know, through the rest of the calendar year. Uh, and what that might mean for uh, profitability, not this year necessarily, but in 2024, as those rates go up, what that might mean to uh, farmers who are borrowing. Well, um, as far as things like uh, land purchases and and so forth, I don't think it'll have as big of an impact. Uh, So I'll go through a few things. I don't think it'll have a huge impact, higher rates uh, in the in the short run at all. Um, with with land prices moving as much as they are, is going to be more of a factor than 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 rates are. And a lot of the a lot of the purchases are being made via cash, uh, or a lot of the purchase percentage wise is coming from cash. So, uh, with that being the case, I'm not sure it'll tremendously move the needle there. Uh, I do think it's going to start having some impact on uh, operating notes. Uh, this year, uh, especially when we look at that, um, compared to last year, I mean, they're, they're double or more than double. And so that's going to, that's going to make a difference. And I think it's going to have an impact on equipment purchases as well. Uh, because while people may, you know, buying things like land, that's, there's some discretion, right. On whether or not you buy farmland, you don't necessarily need to, if it comes up and you have the opportunity, you can do it, but trading off equipment and needing to purchase new equipment on top. So you take equipment prices going up 13, 15% for the last couple of years, year over year, and they're probably going to continue to go up and then tack a seven, 8% interest rate on there, uh, uh, which is more than double a year ago, I think that that's going to cause some strain. Uh, those two factors combined uh, to make things uh, things a lot more difficult. So I think that, look, the fact is uh, prices and yields are going to have more of an impact on profitability than, than interest rates do. I mean, that's 
almost always the case. But it is going to make for some decisions to have to be made on. And, and but I do think the other area, and this is the one I talked about at the lender school on Tuesday, is what's going to happen with rents, though. And I think a sustained higher rate, and I showed it in that dot chart uh, that I had in, in my presentation, but I didn't really say anything about it. The long run that they're talking about now for a federal funds rate is around three and a half to four percent. That's like the indefinite long run interest rate. So we're talking about 5.6% federal funds rate, which I said would translate around seven, seven and a half around the end of the year. Well, you drop it down to like four or so, we probably are talking about maybe a five to five and a half percent interest rate in the long run, right? Down all the way for the foreseeable future. And I made the comment uh, the other day, they're not going to drop rates just to drop them. It's not going to be a deal where they say, oh, well, you know, things are moving, humming right along. So we're going to go ahead and cut them from five and a half, let's say at the end of the year, 5.75% down to three. That is, that is not going to happen. There's going to have to be something that causes them or to react and actually drop rates. So if things continue to hum along and they get inflation under control, I don't think they're going to suddenly just, oops, my camera fell off. I don't think they're going to suddenly just stop uh, uh, or drop rates down. And that's why you saw that long run rate around for the federal funds rate around 4%, which would be five and a half or so, maybe maybe as high as 6% on consumer lending rates. And that's the foreseeable future. So if that happens in those relationships I've talked about where the cap rate on farmland typically tracks a percent or so below or hundred basis points below the uh, interest rate, that would, and the cap rate when, when I just calculated it from last year was about 2.65% ish, depending on what you use. So you effectively have to double, you can either double cash rents or cut land prices in half to get to 5%. Well, I don't, we're not going to cut land prices. I'm not saying that. But I do see an, uh, as interest rates, and this is, you asked the question about rates, one, one thing they could do is start forcing those rental rates up year over year, maybe six, seven, eight, nine, 10%, something like that every single year for the next six, seven years until it falls more in line with that being the case. So to, Back to the original uh, question, how will it affect production costs? I see equip the cost of buying equipment, owning equipment. Uh, and then the thing that Fran will talk about, cost of carrying uh, grain. I mean, interest rates haven't been much of a factor. So he, in his presentations, and I've seen a lot of them, we didn't really talk about that very much because when they're two and a half, three percent, whatever, but you start getting at six, seven, eight percent, all of a sudden that starts mattering quite a bit. So you talk about implicit costs, if you will, or costs of, of holding uh, grain is going to go up. And if you want to hit on that for me real quick with the interest rate thing, frame on the cost of holding grain because of it. Well, I, yeah, I'll comment really quick. So I, I, in fact, I'm working on an article now that'll, sh that'll show up in the next uh, Ag by the Numbers uh, series to talk about that specifically and how important interest rates are in the cost of carry. Um, the cost of storage, both on farm as well as commercial, and it is going to change the movement of grain. Uh, even though grain prices have come down, interest rates have gone up more. And so the cost of carry has actually gone up about 30 to 35% over last year's numbers. And when you think about it in a percentage terms and, and the cost of keeping a, a grain, a grain bin, of, a, a bin of grain on the farm, that has gone up substantially. And, and people are going to have to think about that as they're putting their marketing plans together, as they think about their strategies. And, and obviously, part of the decision in grain marketing is not just how do we get the highest price, but it's also, well, I've got my, my bills to meet and I've got bills to pay and making sure that you have the cash flow at the, at the time that you need it. And so um, we're going to have to rethink and kind of relearn some tools that we haven't had to use in a long time. Thanks, guys. Uh, I don't see any other questions uh, in the queue, and I'll I'll give uh, Ron and Tim this month off. Although I had questions, <laughs> we're over. I think I think we're good. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank the presenters for today, uh, as well as everyone who who joined us. Uh, we will be meeting again next month. It'll be the thirteenth of July, Thursday the thirteenth, not Friday, Thursday the thirteenth. 
Uh, but until then, I hope you guys have a great summer. Thanks. Mm -hmm.